Before I introduce our speaker for the evening, I want you to know about a small exhibition that has been developed by the North Carolina Room staff. And it's on Asheville and Western North Carolina souvenirs. And it's out in the corridor. Um, what is that? To your left up there, there's a wall case. And then there are two um, flat cases with more souvenirs in front of the North Carolina Room door. And upstairs, as you enter the library, there is a, a third flat case filled with rustic souvenirs and salt pepper shakers and all kinds of things that in the early years of Asheville, when people started to come here, they would gather. And Asheville's always been a tourist town. John's going to mention that tonight. And this just talks about how it happened so early. Um, I hope that you will also join us for our next couple of lectures, Danny Bernstein in July, Kevin Frazier in September. And as we move to the heart of the evening, I'm going to ask you to check your cell phones, just to make sure that they're turned off. I know that when mine goes off and then I try and turn it off, it makes a terrible noise, worse than ringing. So, John Ellison is also a board member of the Friends of the North Carolina Room. He is also an avid researcher. John is an Asheville-based writer and former managing editor of the city's alternative newspaper, the Mountain Express. He's an editor and writer for Carolina Public Press and WNC Magazine, a former staff writer for the Durham Independent Weekly. He's co-authored two books, including, with Kent Priestley, North Carolina Curiosities. He's written about history, culture, and politics for the nation, popular communications, and U.S. News and World Report. His reporting has garnered awards from the Association of Alternative News Weeklies, the Society of Professional Journalists, and the North Carolina Press Association. He's also the curator of <coughs> at ABL1915 Twitter feed, which recounts century-old national news, first appearing as the at ABL1914, the feed was launched from the microfilmed records of the North Carolina Room. After more than a year of looking back 100 years, John is going to share with some of us what he has learned from his research and its significance for today. John gave a similar talk earlier this year. We had over 155 people. And I know that in this room right now, there's almost probably 80. So I guess people still are hungry for history, which is pretty terrific. So let's welcome John. <laughs> extra, extra, read all about it. Today's National Citizen Times. Please share with your seatmates as our print run is limited today. In international news, the United States, one month after the sinking of the Lusitania, grows ever closer to involvement. In local news, the Town Board of Aldermen has approved yet another pool hall for the city, <laughs> mandating that in compliance with Jim Crow law, the room be split in half by a curtain and that colored residents enter through a back door. In a local editorial, the Citizen Editorial Board rails against the behavior of local citizens at last night's actual tourist game. <laughs> Tonight, I'll remind everyone to remember 
that people saw the world in color then. That Asheville was a colorful, lively place. And while most of what we'll be showing you today will be in black and white, this is more like what the city looked like at that time. I'll be speaking for about 20 minutes in a rapid fire fashion, but don't let that stop you from interrupting me. If you have any questions, if you can't hear, if I'm too loud, shoot your hand up and we'll interrupt the proceedings. When you got your news 100 years ago, you got it from somebody like this, a young newsie. And you weren't the only one getting the news by a long shot. In fact, it was the city's predominant form of news, the newspaper. Circulation numbers from the time tell us that 10,000 city residents were paying for a daily subscription, subscription to the paper. That's roughly one out of three people who lived here. And I can tell you that the actual Citizen Times would salivate at that kind of numbers today. <laughs> if you think about it, this is pre-television, it was predominantly pre-radio. This was the way people got their best source of information. Asheville, in fact, had two newspapers. One was the Asheville Citizen. Two daily newspapers at that, so we were certainly news towns at the time. One of the things newspapers did at the time was promote business. This is an editorial cartoon from 1915 when business was judged good in Asheville, but we were constantly reminded of the need to boost Asheville. If that doesn't sound familiar, I don't know what will. At the time, the Board of Trade had this to say about our fair city. It is a city set on a hill in the midst of the most beautiful mountain country on this continent. A modern city of 35,000, including suburbs, cosmopolitan in its makeup, progressive, liberal, and given to hospitality. Does that sound familiar? We were spreading the word far and wide about what was occurring in Nashville and inviting folks from around the nation, and indeed around the world, to visit us here. Often, investors from out of town would join us in this pursuit. The Grove Park Inn had been open two years and was already cashing in on Asheville's new spa craze, which continues to this day. This ad offered services to the ladies of Asheville, including treatments for the scalp and hair, manicures, and other services. Um, for those who were naysayers, the calamity howlers, the, uh, the forces of confidence would drive them away, or so we were told. Politics were very vibrant in Nashville 100 years ago, though somewhat consolidated. The Democratic Party had a lock on most of the state, including the state legislature, the governor's office, and a lot of local politics. That said, local politics was starting to pale in comparison to international concerns. The United States had not joined the Great War, but most of its allies had at this point. And one month prior to June 10, 1915, the Lusitania was sunk, uh, the first major spark in getting the United States into the war. In fact, our country would join it for a couple of years. But Ashevillians became increasingly attentive to the war, and news from the war was in the front page headlines every day henceforth. Sometimes local politics were rancorous. At the state political level, one of the year's hottest issues was a child labor bill, which died in the state legislature. We'll talk a little later about some of the other uh, progressive initiatives that did not go forward that year. Asheville had its vices, then as now. Uh, dancing at the time, on the one hand, was seen as a rather common and mundane occurrence until it came to dances like the tango, which had just reached the mountains. And many a preacher railed against this exotic, erotic dance. And there occurred in Asheville a great debate about the merits of dancing closely and to foreign rhythms. <laughs> Traditional forms of love were celebrated. Oh, we have a question. Yes? Closely at what? 
you said they were admonished to not dance closely in uh, to foreign rhythms. Um, oh, to foreign rhythms. Yes, and to um, too close to each other. Uh, traditional forms of love are honored and celebrated. One man, one woman, in marriage only. In fact, there was a city law that barred men and women who were not married from being in the same hotel room. So consequently, uh, some visitors were arrested and taken to the jailhouse because of that status. Uh, stealing rides on freight trains was very much in vogue. Young boys used that method all the time to get around and were sternly punished. People stole mundane items from each other, chickens for example. This clip tells the story of a uh, thief who escaped while several chickens <laughs> fell as casualties. Cockfighting was uh, a popular pastime in parts of Western North Carolina, and consequently showed up in the newspaper. But the real vice was alcohol. Nashville had an alcohol problem, which was that alcohol was not allowed. Prohibition reached North Carolina and Nashville before it reached the rest of the nation. Consequently, federal revenue officers and area deputies and officers spent a great deal of time dismantling networks of homebrewers, moonshiners, and smugglers. Almost every day you find headlines like this one. Sometimes the moonshiners would get away. <laughs> and sometimes the illicit booze was dumped in our dear river. Issues of gender loom large, some of which we recognize today, some of which might blow our minds. Um, our state, in fact, was often depicted as a fair woman to be honored, saluted, provided for, approved. But when it came to actual women and their rights, such as the potential to vote as free citizens, Again this year, 1915, in the state legislature, it was for not. A bill died relatively quickly that would have allowed the franchise for women. For its part, the Asheville Citizen editorialized against the idea. We can say without hesitation that the great majority of women in North Carolina can see nothing alluring in the prospect of the franchise. The paper's editorial board argued, on the one hand, that a wife's vote would be redundant, effectively doubling her husband's vote in a fashion that was somehow unfair. <laughs> Secondly, they argued that women didn't need to be bothered with the concerns of politics. And other arguments uh, buoyed this view for a few more years. At the same time, Asheville at this period had a very active suffrage society that was speaking up more and more public forums, letters to the paper, occasional editorials, and they were gaining ground. Another editorial cartoon on the legislature not passing on the franchise. One ray of hope was that a national woman was appointed the first known republic in the state during 1950. Her appointment was challenged in court, but ultimately supported there, and she went down the annals of state history as one of our first public appointed officials. As you might imagine, issues of race loomed large in Asheville in 1915. It was just 50 years since the end of the Civil War, but in some ways it seemed like not that much time has passed. The era of Reconstruction had <coughs> sidelined African Americans in particular from participating in many parts of civic life, and you can certainly see the effects here in Asheville. Granted, there was a veneer of civility. Often blacks and whites would work together in some capacities. But the notion of them being in the same place, in the same public facilities, was so unusual that when a white man and a black man were placed in the same jail cell, an uproar occurred. Racial prejudices and concerns impacted every part of life for African Americans. 
Take a minute and read these three want ads, which appear right on top of each other. Employers were unabashed in their racial concerns and quite often would say plainly that they wanted a white person. Interestingly, sometimes that they wanted a colored person in the language of the time. We were still in an age when lynchings were not uncommon. In about March of 1915, a pretty uh, classic and disturbing lynching took place in Hickory. This one that appeared in the Asheville Citizen was typical in many regards. And in fact, these were still occurring, of course, all over the South, even in Western North Carolina, which I take a lesson from this. We're often told that race relations in Western North Carolina had more civility, that there was less in the way of racial terror. But if you look at the history of public lynchings here, it belies that. Even in the all-white, all-male Asheville Citizen newspaper, there were instances of resistance that sprang up. In this case, from 1914 actually, a local black man decided he wanted to be served in a white barber shop and proceeded to demand services and literally fight for them in the street with the barber. And there were successes despite the repression Asheville opened one of the finest schools for young black students in 1915. It was welcomed by the local black community and touted it in the newspaper. Likewise, at the YMI in particular, Emancipation Day services took place, all manner of rallies pressing for some modicum of equal rights took place, and black Americans in Asheville were starting to carve out space. Moving on to amusements, Asheville had many, as it does today. The newspaper itself was quite amusing. Um, it had many tabloid-esque qualities, and sometimes the writers would go to great length to take pretty mundane stories and make them uh, more enjoyable. In this case, a, a cat who was something of a Lothario and uh, ultimately met his end. Um, likewise, this story about a possum, um, quite large, only 15 pounds, who in this florid story is described uh, for his exploits. Movies started to appear. Of course, they were silent movies, but Asheville loved them. We had a couple theaters that were widely attended. Every time a new film hit town, it was touted in the paper. And from what we can tell from the newspaper, this was a very popular amusement. Golf, as well, was starting to become established in Asheville. Here we see an editorial cartoon where a fellow actually turns his back on Pinehurst to head to Asheville, which might have been overstating things a bit. As I said, some forms of dancing were out in the open and celebrated. You could even take classes from the Baroness de Cuddleston. At the Battery Park Hotel. Local theater was a big deal. Here's a production of HMS Pinafore, where I forget, perhaps the library staff remembers? Auditorium. At the city auditorium. As you can see, that's a lot of folks involved in a local theater production. Asheville attracted some of the greatest speakers of the time, including one who literally could not speak in the traditional manner. Helen Keller's appearance here in 1914 was sold out and spoken about for weeks. And the circus came to town, to the delight of people young and old, as did the Western North Carolina State Fair, a relatively new creation at the time. This fellow would take a balloon up and then parachute down. And all, of, all other manner of risky things occurred. Asheville was not only a, a haven for tourists, it was a hub for travel elsewhere. You could hop on the Southern Railway and within a day, be in New Orleans, Chicago, New York, 
Tampa, etc., all for about $18. I'm not sure what that would be in today's money. Uh, to get to Havana and back via rail and steamship, it would cost you $44. And then, of course, um, one of my favorite amusements was there, at least for some people. The library at the time wasn't so public. It certainly wasn't integrated. But it saw a lot of use, and the newspaper editorialized on behalf of it. Here's what they said. The library should be a town's best investment, paying the largest dividends in education, character, culture, development, it should be a civic and social center with rooms for lectures, music, debates, discussion. A vital factor in the life of the community, not a building set apart for occasional use as a source of information or as a means of distraction. It should be a constant inspiration. What it means to a town is limited only by what the people determine that it shall be. And with that, I conclude my main presentation and would love to take your questions. But first, let me tell you where you can see more about Asheville in 1915. I run a Twitter feed, as Lynn was telling you, that will show you daily headlines from the newspaper. Uh, you can see that on Twitter if you like. If you don't want to mess with Twitter, you don't have to. You'll be fine. You can also see it online at twitter.com slash ADL1915. Better yet, you can find the feed on the blog of the North Carolina Room, which is called Herb Tell, uh, which is a great place to see all manner of local mysteries solved and local history investigated. So please visit that, and uh, I think you'll be pleased with that. Uh, that concludes my brief presentation. If I can hand this mic off to a staffer, we'll get your questions and chat for a while.
get back to you. Um, in the political cartoons, there's a, it seems to feature like a magpie character in every one, uh, giving some additional commentary. It's almost like he's speaking Ebonics or something. It might be a caricature of a, maybe an African American. Do you know any more about that, or about the cartoonist, or what he was doing here? I, I don't know much. I do know that on the very front page of the paper for years, this cartoonist had a daily cartoon. And he always included this little side character. He almost looks like, um, what were those two birds? I call them that. Yeah, kind of looks like that. And he, he might be in blackface, and he does kind of speak in a, in a different uh, iteration of English for sure. And he, he kind of plays the wisecracker to the whatever the topic is of the cartoon. I think his name is Billy Bourne, is that correct? Billy Bourne. The signature looks like that. The cartoonist might be Billy Bourne. We have looked up a few articles on him, but I can't tell you what the result was off the top. We had a question on the front, so. Where was the library? Library was right at the corner of Pack Square, correct? Yes. Yes. In the uh, pre Civil War building, it was called the Palmetto Building. Uh, it preceded the one that's there now, was the Art Museum. We'll show you a picture here. Right here. Yep. As long as you have that picture up, can you tell us some of the other buildings in the next part? Absolutely. And uh, library staffers help me out on this. Um, you'll see, this was a library building. I don't know what this building was in that iteration. That was a legal building. That was a legal building. That was a city building, um, which is about where city, city building is today, maybe closer to Pack Square would appear. Where the information booth is now. Yeah, it's okay, much closer. Okay, much closer than where the booth is. This side of Splashville. <laughs> what the next monument you recognize. Something I might have mentioned is that Asheville had trolley service all over town into some outlying towns, which I think a lot of folks would like to see today. Where's Broad, uh, Where's Beltmore Broadway in that picture? Broadway would have been coming this way, the Biltmore heading down this way. It's not in the picture because it's more towards us. This is literally Biltmore right here going this way, if it was named that at the time. Oh, Broadway's coming awesome. from that direction. Yeah. Where, is it, where is the current city hall then? Back here behind this, and then the county building back here behind this. Behind the big long red building over there? That's, the that's correct. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is our big packed square park now looking in that direction. If you're standing at the noodle shop looking towards the mountain there, the cut. That's this perspective. Yeah. Just to let you know, there the square actually was a square and kind of where um, what's the Brick Street? Is that Market Street? Market Street? That was where the city building was, and the city building housed actually city markets and all kinds of things. So it was a way, it formed, a, the square formed an actual square. It's a good point. This is a literal square. This is a city building. Behind and next to it was a city market, correct? In the same it's building. In it. Yeah. So the in fire it. department were in those three arches on the front of it in city market. Okay. Oh. There's your fire department doors. Any other questions? I, I've always heard uh, exciting stories or perhaps rumors about pedestrian tunnels that exist in Nashville. Can, uh, are there, is there any clarification on that that anybody can give? Hopefully you got that, everyone heard that question about underground Nashville, about pedestrian tunnels beneath the city. Um, I've been on tours of areas that purport to be part of that infrastructure. Um, more, most often I think it was pretty utilitarian for plumbing, eventually electric lines, sometimes for storage. I don't think there was a vast network of tunnels beneath the city. And mind you, for a long time, right beneath Pack Square, there, there were bathrooms beneath there. And there was talk of eventually putting a shopping center down there, but I don't think it ever got very far. If anyone cares to add anything on that front, please. I, I've always wondered, are the bathrooms still there? I was told they were under the Vance Monument. When they built the, the 
parking garage for the Biltmore building. I can check it out then. Yeah, you can you can see pictures of the stairs leading to the bathrooms under there, and they're pretty close to the monument. I waited on a patron once who was part of the demolition of the underground restrooms, and he said they were basically filled in at that time, and there was gorgeous marble that just oh, oh. well. And then that may have been removed since then. My grandma said they had beautiful blue cobalt tiles. Oh. Wow. Be nice to have that back, huh? You can you can see in the the older pictures that they were in fact segregated bathrooms. There, there were signs leading out of Pack Square that would tell colored folks where to go and white folks where to go. Okay. What was the footprint of the city? Where did the city line end? It's a great question. What was the footprint of the city? Uh, it was obviously much smaller than it is today. At the time, West Asheville was its own incorporated town, so it wasn't part of Asheville proper. Uh, I don't know how to tell you very well what the, the city limits were. Um, you know, they were calling the population at the time about a third of what it is now. We might presume that the footprint was about a third, but it's kind of a rough shot on my behalf. If you visit the North Carolina room, which is right around the corner here, I'll be happy to show you some maps. Yes? How many bridges were there across the uh, French Broad at that time? How many bridges across the French Broad? Good question. You'll see pictures of one or two up here that were recently built at the time. In, in Asheville's environs, I would say several. They probably didn't compare and scale the ones we have today. What do you say, staff? Pearson's Bridge went across the Riverside Park, and the Southern Railway had a bridge going across, and that would be the uh, first West Asheville Bridge, I think we have an image of. Craven Street Bridge was Who was the largest employer at that time? That's a really good question. The largest employer at the time? Biltmore? No, Biltmore hadn't been open to the public, per se. That's, which is not to say that a lot of folks didn't work to build the place. It had been fully built out by that point. Uh, we had a big agricultural economy at the time. A lot of folks involved with livestock and various food stocks. Uh, we, we had a, a pretty large number of mills of various sorts and factories, wood turning and what have you. It, it was, in fact, a pretty dangerous era to, to be a day laborer. Uh, in the, the newspapers at the time, you find a lot of reports of various maimings and injuries and, you know, arms getting lopped off and what have you. Uh, so, yeah, it was perilous, particularly for children. Yes, Nan? I think there may have been a blanket mill that was one of the largest blanket mills in the country at that time. Yeah, big blanket mill, Nan is saying. Before the one in Swannanoa, before Beacon? I think it was around on the French Broad. Okay. And there were a lot of leather works. Uh-huh. Yeah, tanneries and what have you. Glass work. Yeah, absolutely. Who else? In the back. What was the state of uh, general electricity use a hundred years ago? I get the sense that it was pretty common in the city center, but very rare once you got out of that. One thing that was happening in the early 1910s was city leaders were constantly touting what they called the Great White Way. You'll see an illustration of it here, where electric lighting was just being put down our city streets, kind of from the center going out, and it was thought of as a real milestone in Asheville's modernity. If we could have street lights, we'd be part of the modern world. So they were building it out from there, at least in terms of the lighting. Similar with the telephone. Not, not, I was surprised not that many folks were using the telephone. So you see a lot of ads trying to persuade folks that the phone could be useful in their lives. Another comment on that photo. I think that one of the buildings on the left-hand block is now the IM Pay building. Uh -huh was the Western Union office in 1915 was before radio so people would men would gather to hear the baseball games transmitted by telegraph. I'm so glad Dan mentioned that. People were huge baseball fans but not having 
radio to hear instant broadcasts, not only when they go to Western Union, at the actual citizen office in 1915 in October, whenever they had the World Series, they had like a, uh, an, an illustrative board set up with little pegs for players. And you could go watch the game in real time via telegraph while they move the players around the board.
monument <laughs> oh that was just opened, and that there is a surviving copy of that that's in the hands of the Western North Carolina Archives folks who are repairing, restoring, conserving, conserving it. Um, so that's, you know, the, there were columns for the black community that were published in the Citizen at times. I see. Yes, and Lynn mentions that amazing find in the time capsule of late. If you haven't seen the actual Citizen Times story from a few days ago about that find, it's really great research and unearths as much as it seems you can about that particular newspaper at the time. I, I have noted that, it, Aaron, to get to your question, at points further east in the state, there was a lot more vibrant African American press at the time, Durham. Maybe Charlotte, even cities like Statesville. And I wonder if those papers made their way here uh, via travelers and families and what have you, but I don't know. Well, I know you mentioned the Southern Railway, and I know that the Chicago Defender would go all the way down to New Orleans, that people would carry it down, uh -huh. like old copies to sell. Because uh -huh. that was even more than the New Amsterdam and News in New York. That was considered like the paper national, or at least for the East Coast. Got it. So preeminent black papers would circulate even down here. Yes? Um, can you say anything about um, tuberculosis treatment that was going on? I mean, my understanding was that both tourism and national hospitals got their start because people were coming to the mountains for treatment of tuberculosis. Was this still an issue in 1915? or? I think we still, and man, correct me if I say any of this wrong, but I think we still were a health haven in many respects. We're still touting the quality of the air, the water. Uh, at the same time, there, there comes a turn where we don't want to be known as the place that sick people congregate. <laughs> man, can you elaborate? Well, my impression from that time is the conditions were really bad, and even though it had, the city had a reputation as a curative place, in the city that was rampant tuberculosis, Thomas Wolfe was a victim. The boarding houses had to be monitored by a tuberculosis board and they would be shut down. They kept statistics and it was really terrible. I see. And there, there are constant campaigns at the time against flies, against vermin, against dirty water, dirty sidewalks. So we weren't a pristine uh, health resort. Would you talk about air quality? I noticed in that first slide, the Battery Park Hotel is belching black smoke. Yes, it's a good point. Um, this would come up in newspaper editorials a lot. What do we do about the fact that we're burning so much coal we can barely see some days in the city streets? Because it was a, the predominant source of energy, everyone was burning it for the most part, and it really gunked the place up. Uh, I don't know. You know, you don't always have to be there to know how much of a nuisance it was, but it sure did come up a lot. Um, based on the fact that you've been perusing actual papers 1914, 1915 era, I'm just curious um, how enamored locals were, if at all, with the Vanderbilts, being that the estate was not open to the public when <coughs> George died in 1914. I'm just curious, you know, what was being reported, if anything. Sure. I know when George died, uh, I'll, repeat, I'll repeat the question. The question is, what did, how did locals relate to the Vanderbilts during this era where the estate had been operative for a decade or two, but um, it wasn't a public um, resource the way it might be thought of today. And I think, yeah, I don't know exactly what to compare it to, but when Vanderbilt died, when George died in 1914, it was the headline all the way across the paper for a couple days. It's definitely thought of as an economic force in the city, even prior to any tourism that would necessarily come straight out of visiting the estate. Obviously what they've done to vitalize Biltmore Village and our crafters, workers, what, they made a huge imprint on the community economically. And uh, I know that his passing was uh, deeply known. I don't even think he was living here at the time, but yeah, yeah folks definitely knew who the neighbor was down the road. Yes, in the back. How did you make your daily selections without reading through the entire paper every day? That's a good question. How do I pick the snippets that I put in the Twitter feed? 
<laughs> and so something I grapple with every day for the last, all, actually almost two years I've been doing this. And I lean towards news that's a bit obscure and or telling and or ex exemplary of something. There's a lot of mundane things that got reported that I wouldn't want to bore folks with. At the same time, I wouldn't want to have just sensational material. So I try to pick the, the stories that are illustrative of something special about that time or about our city. And the examples are there. They jump out at you. Uh, the paper was only 12 pages long at the time. And it's like any news product you become familiar with. You quit reading the classifieds at some point, unless you want to. You quit reading the society page. You know, you kind of know where to go for the local headlines. Interestingly, the front page was blanketed with international and national news. Very rarely would local news make it on the front page, except in those cartoons. I don't know why. You mentioned uh, during 1915, there's the kind of build up to the US during World War I or, or more kind of coverage of that. What was the tone of the coverage? Was there a lot of anti-German sentiment like we saw during World War II? Yeah, the question, in the years leading up to the war, was there much in the way of nationalism or anti-German sentiment? At this point in the papers, and for two years before the United States actually enters the war, I think, at least in small towns like Asheville, people are kind of aghast at, at what's occurring. They're forming aid societies uh, to send aid to Belgium and uh, to England, and they're having a hard time getting their head around this form of modern warfare, which was pretty unprecedented. Submarine warfare was rearing its head for the first time in a real sense in war and that terrified and interested people. The very first photos that appear in the National Citizen are from the front lines in France and Germany. And uh, people were absolutely fascinated by it, terrified of it, pretty isolationist. Um, at least the National Citizen editorial board just wanted to stay out of it. It felt very far away. And in some context, it was pointed at as a boon for the United States. Let the civilized nations over there duke it out. In the meantime, we'll stay home in the United States and continue to improve our lot. That was a really strong sentiment that I was surprised by. Got time for just a few more, yes? I'd like to know a little bit more about your process putting together the Twitter feed. I'm imagining you don't go every day to the Carolina room and pull up today's paper. You, are you printing them out for microfiche and taking them home? Or are you doing a month's work at a time and cherry picking and printing it all out? Yeah, Jason wants to know how I put together the Twitter feed logistically, which is a really good question. And um, I started doing it very manually in the North Carolina room, the only way I knew how. And I was going to the microfiche, either jotting down headlines, or making photocopies and scanning them and uploading. Um, when I saw something that I thought needed to go up as an image. And that's okay, but it's a pretty time-consuming process. So these folks can testify, <laughs> I was spending a lot of time in there. And then newspapers.com digitized a lot of the actual citizen, like a 50, 60 year span. Um, so for a nominal fee, I'm able to scan through it quickly at home and copy and paste images and what have you. And so that sped the process, and then on top of that, via applications like Hootsuite, you can, you can front load the content for a week or a month or what have you. So sometimes I'll just spend a weekend uploading two or three weeks worth of posts that will come out automatically on the schedule, so I don't have to do it every day. I just wanted to mention, he uh, referred to newspaper.com, and the North Carolina room has a subscription to that. You're welcome to come in and use it. It is an absolutely incredible resource, the keyword searching. Uh, we've been able to find answers to things that we would have spent years in the time without it. I'll second that. It's amazing. You should go. Like, if you're looking for news about an old relative, news story, a bit of history is a great resource. And right now, it's pretty much, pretty much just up through 1922. Um, you mean it doesn't go, it doesn't go past 22? The, the actual citizen in particular, there are probably actual newspapers on there that might span other periods, I'm not sure. And there are, there are other sources for digitized North Carolina newspapers via the state and other sources, uh, but they don't all have such great character recognition where you can search out 
so many <coughs> fine details. We're just about at the end of our window here. Uh, I'll be around if you want to come see me here and ask any questions. Certainly some of the library staff is here. They're always here at the North Carolina room, and I highly recommend you come and visit them because they're a font of information. And at the North Carolina room, we like to say research is a delight. Thank you for coming out tonight.